So let's keep reading their answer. In the text in which the angel is called God or the Lord, it's imperative to notice that he is always identified as an angel. This point is important, by the way, again, um, they want you to believe almost that it's the word angel in its normative sense. And this is somewhat true because the word angel most popularly in the Bible refers to the created beings that uh, serve God and are uh, ministering uh, servants to uh, mankind as well of which a third of them are fallen angels, right? We're talking about created beings. They're lesser than God, but they're more powerful than humans. That's the normative use of the word angel, the Hebrew word malach and the Greek word um, uh, angelos, from where we get the English word angel. However, the word, the word angel and the concept of angel, even both in the Hebrew and in the Greek, is more generically also just messenger. So that's helpful to keep in mind as we understand that God sends messengers. Messengers can be angelic messengers, i.e. supernatural, or they can be human messengers, like Jesus is a human messenger. And throughout the Old Testament, we see humans being sent on on the behalf of other humans, and the Hebrew word chosen for messenger is many times the word that we would translate ordinarily as angel. So they're not saying that here in this in this part, but I want you to realize that. So um, it's imperative to notice that he's always identified as an angel. The reason that's imper- imperative for them is because they're trying to draw this dichotomy, a difference between God is not an angel, and Jesus is definitely not an angel, but the angel of the Lord is just an angel. My point is that the angel of the Lord is not merely an angel. He is a messenger, and Jesus is a messenger, and therefore, when we're talking about messenger, we can begin to realize that God shows up in theophany form as his own messenger, and yet it is God. We're going to read about that in Genesis 18, eventually, where God shows up like looking like a man, but, but the text talks about angels, and it talks about men, and it talks about God, and all three words are used, and we have to make sense of that passage. So um, they go on to say, sorry, I don't mean to keep uh, interrupting. I should just read their answer first. This point is important, they say, because God is never called an angel. God uh, God is God. Well, actually, they're not quite right here. They say God is never called an angel. Um, No, God is is called an angel by humans. um, We'll see this in uh, a text that I'm going to bring up if we have time. So if a being is called God, but it's clearly identified as an angel, there must be a reason. I also want to let you know that when we get to the book of Hebrews, which I hope to get to tonight, I might not, the, the writer to the book of Hebrews takes great pains to explain to us readers that Jesus is greater than angels. So even if we say that the angel of the Lord is Jesus, we have to stop at some point in time and realize that Jesus is not an angel. He's greater than angels. So therefore, we can't say that the angel of the Lord is Jesus in the truest sense of the word that Jesus is, that would equate Jesus with an angel. Jesus is more than an angel. He's greater than angels. And that's what the writer of the book of Hebrews makes a a great point in pointing out to us, pointing out for us and teaching us. At the same time, as we understand the New Testament, in its normative, literal sense, Jesus the man wasn't brought onto planet Earth until he came out of Mary's womb. Therefore, the pre-incarnate picture that we're seeing here in the Old Testament is not a human thing. It's not a human being. So whatever the angel of the Lord is, it sh- it cannot be a human for a couple of reasons. Number one, angels aren't humans, even though they look like humans. Their com- their composition is is more than human. Right? It's meta human. It's it's more powerful than human. In fact, the, the proof is that they can show up suddenly and then step into a pillar of fire and then go up into uh, go up into heaven. Right. So angels are not human beings. Jesus is a human being. So there's two very good reasons why Jesus is why the angel Lord in one sense cannot be Jesus. Number one, Jesus is greater than angels. So no matter who the angel of the Lord is, Jesus is greater than any angel, right? Category class angel. And number two, Jesus is truly human. He's fully human. He's truly human. He's 100% human like me. Therefore, the angel He's in a different being class category. So those are two reasons we need to think about. All right, I'll, I'll stop commenting and just read their answer. This is important because God is never called an angel. God is God. So if a being is called God, but is clearly identified as an angel, there must be a reason. In the record in Genesis quoted above, the angel is clearly identified as an angel four separate times. 
Why then would the text say that the Lord spoke to her? It does so, here's their answer, because of God's agent or messenger. The angel was speaking for God, and the message he brought was God's message. The same basic idea is expressed when God, quote-unquote, is said to visit, quote-unquote, his people, when actually he sends some form of blessing. And they, they refer you to the notes on Luke 7, 16. God himself does not show up, but someone unfamiliar with the culture might conclude from the wording that he did. Also, some of the people to whom the angel appeared clearly expressed their belief he was an angel of God. Gideon exclaimed, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. By the way, by comparison, that's Judges 6.22, by comparison, uh, Hagar did not say, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. She said, I saw God face to face, and I and yet I lived. And there are other people who talk about seeing God. Um, they conclude, or they continue, there's conclusive biblical evidence that God's messengers and representative are called God, see the notes on Hebrew 1.8. This is important because if representatives of God are called God, then the way to distinguish God from his representative is by the context. Now, I'll give them that, right? Context is always king. We have already shown that when the angel of the Lord is called God, the context is careful to let the reader know that the angel is, in fact, an angel. All right? Point number three. Another piece of evidence, they say, that reveals that the angel of the Lord is an angel and not a co-equal member of the Trinity is that he's under the command of the Lord. In one record, David disobeyed God and a plague came on the land. And uh, the quote says, God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem, 1 Chronicles 21, 15. We learn from the record that it was the angel of the Lord afflicting the people and eventually, quote, the Lord was grieved because of the calamity and said to the angel who was afflicting the people, enough, withdraw your hand. And the angel of the Lord was then at the threshing floor of Arunah the Jebusite, 2 Samuel 24, 16. These verses, they say, are not written as if this angel was somehow God himself. There's no co-equality here. This is simply the Lord giving commands to one of his angels. Point number four by biblicalunitarian.com. Another clear example showing that the angel of the Lord cannot be God in any way is in Zechariah. Zechariah was speaking with the angel about a vision he had. The Bible records, quote, Then the angel of the Lord said, Lord Almighty, how, lo how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and from the towns of Judah, which you have been angry with these 70 years? So the Lord spoke kind and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. The me, of course, there is Zechariah, and the reference is Zechariah 1, 12, and 13. They point out, this is the uh, biblical Unitarianism, the fact that the angel of the Lord asked the Lord for information and then received comforting words indicates that he is not co-equal with God in power or knowledge. It is unthinkable that God would need information or need comforting words. Thus, any claim that the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ, who is in every way God, just cannot be made to fit what the Bible actually says. Point five. It is interesting that two pieces of evidence that Trinitarians use to prove that the angel of the Lord must be the pre-incarnate Jesus are that the Bible clearly states that he is separate from God and that he speaks with God's authority. We would argue that they, they continue. We would argue that the reason he is separate from God is because he's clearly that. I'm sorry, he's clearly what the text calls him, i.e. an angel, and that he speaks with authority because he's bringing a message from God. So they're talking about the angel of the Lord when they say he is an angel. They're not talking about Jesus there. The prophets and others, they say, who spoke for God also spoke with authority, as many verses affirm. Also, the angel of the Lord speaks about God in third person. For example, they reference Genesis 16, 11 above. The angel says, quote, the Lord has heard your misery, end quote. The angel does not say, quote, I have heard of your misery, as if he were God. Again, yes, if we only looked at one verse, then he does speak in uh, first person as if he's God. Um, I'm sorry, he speaks in third person. But earlier in the passage, he speaks in first person. So it's almost like they're trying to get you not to see the entire passage. Um, they go on to say, in Genesis 22, 12, the angel said, quote, Now I know that you fear God, not, quote, now I know you fear me. We're going to, when we get to Genesis 22, because they're going to bring it up again, and we're going to look at it again. That's the exchange between uh, Abraham offering his son Isaac on the altar. We're going to find again, as with this exchange with Hagar, 
There are times when the angel speaks as God, and there are times when the angel speaks in third person, uh, as the or speaks of God in third person, times as first person. So we'll have to we'll deal with that text when the time comes. In Judges 13, 5, this is the reference I mentioned earlier about Samson. The angel says Samson will be set apart to God. He's speaking to Samson's parents. The angel will be set apart to God, not set apart to me. So although the text can call the angel God, which is proper for a representative of God, the angel never said that he was God and even referenced, referred to God in the third person. Actually, there is a reference where I'll show you where the angel does say, I am the Lord. All right, we'll find that. We'll look at that in a moment. Or not, maybe not tonight, but in time. Um, maybe tonight, maybe next week, at least, where we're dealing with this angel of the Lord. This might go one week or two weeks. It might even go three weeks, but I'm spending a little bit more time on this because this is one of the predominant and very strong um, Trinitarian versus Unitarian arguments, the angel of the Lord. They con continue. Also, if Jesus were the angel of the Lord who um, spoke to Moses at the burning bush, then he did not say so in his teaching. Mark 12, 26 records Jesus speaking with the Sadducees and saying, have you, and this is a quote from Jesus, have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the bush how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, And quote. And so they remind you, this is biblical Unitarianism, they remind you, if Jesus had been the angel in the bush and was openly proclaiming himself to be, quote, the preexistent God, end quote, he would have used this opportunity to say, quote, right, you ready? Notice, notice, let me pause, let me interject. Notice their argumentation mindset. Notice the way in which they're reading. If X, Y, Z is, I'm sorry, if A, B, C is true, then shouldn't we see X, Y, Z? Notice that's very similar to the way the atheist argues against the existence of God. They say, if Jesus had been the angel of the bush, in the bush. And then, again, this is really, in my opinion, in my experience, a wrong-headed way of approaching the text. I don't stand in judgment of the text. It's almost as if I'm pointing my bony finger at God and saying, God, if you're, if you're right, if you're correct, if you're God, and if your word is accurate, then why don't I see these words? As if God is obligated to write the way that I think he should write. As if God and Jesus are obligated to act the way that I think they should act. Right? That's illogical, people. Don't think that. What we must do is we must read the Bible and take what the text says as the final authority. God is the authoritative uh, party here. He says what he says. He means what he means. He acts the way he acts because he's God. He chooses the words that he that he says he chooses the actions that he performs he keeps his own counsel he doesn't he doesn't confer with me and say Arl, what's the best way that i should write what may would be what way do you think would be the most convincing which way would be the the more logical way to to pin the words Arl, which way should i act that's more convincing to you he doesn't confer with me he doesn't ask me he doesn't get my permission to write the way he wants to write or act the way he wants to act no, he's God. He's almighty. His words are his words. So he writes what he wants. He acts the way he wills because he's God. And of course, all of his words are righteous and all of his actions are righteous. So what that means is what when I encounter his words and his actions, they stand in judgment of me, not the other way around. Please stop judging the Bible. Let the Bible judge you. You don't judge the Bible. So stop saying if Jesus had been the angel in the bush and was openly proclaiming himself to be the pre-existent God, he would have used this opportunity to say, right, if ABC, then XYZ. It doesn't work that way, people. It doesn't work that way. It is the way it is because God made it the way it is. And I then have to deal with the data. I have to deal with the existing um uh, information that's in front of me and say, hmm, okay, that's peculiar. I don't understand why God did it that way. I understand exactly where he's going with that statement or that action. But since he's God and he's perfect, it must be the right thing to do and the right thing to say. And then I begin to pray about and, and chew on and meditate on um, the thing that I'm dealing with. But in no way, in shape, and form do I have permission to say, that can't be right because if it were true, and then fill in the blank with whatever presupposition that I bring to the table or whatever objection based on what I think it should look like. 
So go back and listen to the last two weeks on, on this um, series and you'll see what I'm talking about. So notice the biblical Unitarian is doing this right again, again. If Jesus had been the angel in the bush and was openly proclaiming himself to be the preexistent God, then what Jesus should have said was, quote, I said to Moses, end quote. Right? That's the way we read the Bible. If, if, if Jesus was God, then why didn't he say it in so many terms? If God is, is really God, then why doesn't he, uh, if he's tripart, why doesn't he say it right up front? Why doesn't he say, um, I am God, I am three, I'm one, but I'm three. You know, those types of illogical um, um, objections. Let's continue. The fact that Jesus said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on my soapbox there. I just couldn't, couldn't resist. We are not going to get into my own uh, passage tonight. I'm going to finish reading their um, objection. And then I'll close tonight. Because I'm already uh, into my, uh, I'm already uh, used up my 30 minutes that I allot for this uh, section. So we'll, we'll deal with this tonight, and then next week we'll begin to look at. We'll turn straight into my own uh, response to their objection. So let's finish their um, uh, explanation about the angel of the Lord first. The fact that Jesus said it was God who spoke to Moses shows clearly that he was differentiating himself from God, and then. Um, Point number six, which I think, nope, six, seven, eight. Six, seven, eight. You know what? I don't want to go too fast. Let's let's just slow down. Let's pick this up next week. I I, I was gonna read all of theirs uh and uh, pick up with mine next week, but we'll start with um we'll start with their point number six next week. That'll do it for a Trinitarian response to biblical Unitarianism.